Good evening, and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, views, and issues from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this evening, we're joined by Steve Forbes. Yep, that's Steve Forbes, <laughs> chairman and CEO of Forbes Media, as well as the author of the new book, uh, the Freedom Manifesto, and we'll talk a little bit more about him and the book as we go through this evening. Steve, thanks for joining us. Good to be with you, Chris. Thank you. So tell us a little bit. Many of us know about your background with Forbes Media, Forbes Magazine, those types of things, but what prompted you to go the direction of writing not just this book, but many books about overreach of government and ways that we might restructure our freedom, uh, back to freedom? Well, you're always looking and trying to find out what's going right, what's going wrong, and uh, how do you make things better. And uh, one of the things you learn when you follow business is that the successful entrepreneurs don't take things as they are. They don't accept it as inevitable. And that's how I got interested in the flat tax. Why in the world do we have a 9 million word tax code that nobody understands? It's been changed 14,000 times in the last 25 years. Why do we, do we have to put up with it? Answer is no, and uh, that's how I get interested in the flat tax. Then in terms of uh, government, why in the world does government get bigger? We're not talking about normal government that James Madison and others, very essential services government performs, but the big bloated government that we have today, doing things that government is not fit to do and taking on powers that it shouldn't have, whether it's seizing children without due process or uh, writing regulations in a way where they're so vague, if they want to get you, they can. Right. That's profoundly wrong. Laws should be simple so you understand them, you know whether you're obeying them or not, instead of this vague thing where if they get mad at you, they get you. Yeah, and it's not even just that they're vague. In many cases, they're contradictory. So if you're in compliance with one law, that means you're violating another. And so, unfortunately, we have a situation, though, where as a culture, many of us have lost touch with what is the responsibility, what is the role of government. Isn't government always on our side and meant to be compassionate to us and give us things versus protect us from things? Help us just set the stage for your interpretation of what the government should do versus what it maybe should stay away from. Well, in addition to defense and internal order, if you mm -hmm. don't have that, it's very hard to do other things. Right. Uh, government has uh, some, uh, and by the way, our founders understood if government can keep order, it also has the power to ultimately to be a tyranny. Mm -hmm. And that's why they divided the powers of government. So one person or one group couldn't get all the levers of government. Right. So in terms of uh, safety, you have responding to disasters. Right. Uh, making sure we have infrastructure uh, for people who can't afford it, education, uh, basic things like that, creating an environment where people have a chance to get ahead right. in terms of uh, entrepreneurship. Right. And that means a fair tax system that is understandable, reasonable uh, level of taxation. It means a sound currency so you don't have uh, government deciding what you get and what you don't get. Mm -hmm. and this gets to the economy we have today. Why aren't we doing better? We're like a baseball player in a perpetual slump. Now mm -hmm. we're hitting 250. We think, boy, that's great. <laughs> no, we should be hitting 350. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, you're not known as an anti-capitalist by any means. Um, <laughs> and I know one of the things that is a sign of, in our estimation, a, a healthy and growing economy is one where there's a freer market system. And since you're uh, not an anti-capitalist, and capitalism is a, a tool that you subscribe to heavily, do you think there should be a completely free market with no regulation whatsoever? Well, in terms of the advocates of big government, they always pose the choice as a lot of regulation, a lot of government power, or anarchy. Right. No, there's a difference. James Madison, father of our Constitution, understood that you need rules of the road. As he put it, if we were angels, we'd not need laws, we'd not need government. Manifestly, we're not angels, except maybe grandchildren, and they only to a certain age. <laughs> so uh, it's similar to you have right. rules against going 100 miles an hour in a school zone. Right. You don't uh, drive when you're drunk. But that's very different from the government telling you what to drive, where to drive, and when to drive. And that's the situation we have today. Right. Government has overreached its bounds, and it's hurting opportunity. Who's hurt the most? when you don't have a chance to uh, start a business or get a job. It's people who have the least. Right. They don't have a chance to climb that ladder. 
Exactly, exactly. And so you're not a fan then of Mayor Bloomberg's uh, uh, tactics and trying to force people to walk the stairs or drink well, certain again, size sodas. Free freedom, <laughs> freedom means taking responsibility for yourself. Right. Whether it's a Steve Jobs learning painfully how to become an effective leader, overcoming mm -hmm. the shortcomings of his personality. Remember, he was fired from his own company at a young age. Yes. But he learned and became a great leader. That's what freedom is about. And so maybe we shouldn't drink big sodas. Right. But that should be our choice. Right. And to learn and to uh, and, and make mistakes and learn from it. That's how you become a more better person. Right. And so. Uh, Markets are always portrayed as cold and cruel and greedy and all that kind of thing. It's just the opposite. Government is short-sighted. The next election. Government is about meeting its own needs. Look what it did, for example, a year ago in that Chicago school strike. Chicago is one of the worst school systems in the country. What was the debate about? Salaries, benefits, when you retire. Not about the rotten education kids are getting. No. Or s the funding of Social Security. That's supposed to have two and a half trillion dollars in reserves. There's nothing there. They spent the money and put in non-market IOUs. Chris, can you imagine if you were a business person and you took money from your workers and said, this is for your pension. You went and spent the money mm -hmm. and then put non-marketable IOUs right. in their pension plans. We, you would not be here. You'd be wearing big stripes. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that kind of thing is illegal. But Silver government does bracelets, that. maybe some anklets to yeah. match. Yeah. And, 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 and big government does that all the time. It uses the rhetoric of compassion. But right. if you think about it, free markets are about meeting the needs of other people. Even if you lust for money, yes. you don't get it unless you provide something that somebody else wants. Without you knowing it, it has you focus on the needs and wants of other people. Right. And it, but it also means that in some cases, and you were using crazy terms there, like the, the assumption that people might be able to fail and it would make them better. And we've gotten to a kind of a veal calf kind of a society where we want to keep everyone. Sure, they're, they're in a small kennel, but at least they won't get hurt there. And that actually is counterproductive. Well, uh, the, the way you grow, the way you learn is through experience. Right. Uh, it's not enough to read the books. It's not enough to dream up things. You've right. got to go out and find out. And the one of the virtues of free markets is you learn from failure. Yes. Look, look, look at the iPod. It came out of the success of the Walkman, which is what the Walkman should have evolved into. Right. But you had the Lisa, you had the Newton, you had all these previous uh, failures. But from that, you got a product that changed the world, changed the music industry. Right. And so uh, failure is not something that you have to write off. Yes, financially you might, but you learn something. Right. And that's the accumulation of knowledge. Free markets are about knowledge. As George Gilder says, what's the difference between us today and the people in the Stone Age? Same people, same materials on earth. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? We know more. Right. And it's the creation, accumulation of knowledge of people doing things we didn't think was possible before. Right. That's how we move ahead. Creativity, innovation. Right. And that creativity and innovation applied to failures or shortcomings is what entrepreneurialism is all about, which obviously you've been a champion of for many, many years. And, and, and this gets to uh, the health care debate. Right. Uh, why, why do we have uh, health care, medical care crisis in this country? And uh, people say, well, we want more health care and there's not enough of it and it's too expensive. But think of it in free markets. One of the virtues of free markets, if they're allowed to operate, Mm -hmm. is you turn scarcity into abundance. Right. You take the cell phone, 30 years ago, big as a shoebox, uh, had a 40-minute battery life. The first one cost $3,995. Yes. Today, six, seven billion around the world. Everyone has them, all sorts of choices. And they do way, way beyond voice. That's almost a peripheral thing now. It does right. everything else. Right. And, and that came because people constantly trying to turn luxuries into uh, commodities. Right. We can do the same thing in health care. And the proof of it of uh, the kind of crazy system we have today, but we don't realize it is because we've grown up with it, is if you go to a hospital and you ask in advance what it costs, you're going to get a very strange look, Chris. It means oh, yeah. one of two things. Either you're uninsured or you're crazy. Right. Why do you want to know the price? So you can pay for it cash potentially if you have the means. Uh, but but, but it, 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 it's crazy. And right. so we don't have real free markets. It's all third party. Right. And when it's third party, it means the patient is not the customer. And that's why it's all attuned to meeting the needs of the government, the insurers, businesses, not to the patient. Right. We've got to change that. Absolutely. And so, obviously, all of these things that you're, you're describing are exciting to me. 
because I'm like-minded. But obviously, you don't write books necessarily just for the right mind, for the, the same mindedness. You write them to expand your audience. Talk to us a little bit about Freedom Manifesto and the expanded title and what you're trying to accomplish with your latest work. Well, uh, Freedom Manifesto, and the subtitle is Why Free Markets Are Moral and Big Government Isn't, is to explain to people who want to learn, want to know, in very straightforward language, uh, what is the truth about free markets? Free markets are people. Right. And what is the truth about big government? And the contrast, you see it all the time, FedEx or the post office, Silicon Valley or Detroit, freedom or big brother, mm -hmm. optimism versus pessimism. One of the things about free markets is, without, again, you knowing it, it has you have faith in the future. Mm -hmm. Investing, if you're an investor, if you're an entrepreneur, you're the last one that gets paid. Yes. If you start a business, you've got to pay your workers, your suppliers, the taxes, everything else. Insurance. And, 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 and you're the last one to get it. So you have to have faith that this thing is ultimately going to work. Right. And if it doesn't, you take the hit. Right. And, 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 and so when, 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 when you have that kind of a, a system, it, it, people are constantly innovating, and uh, people from the most unlikely places. I mean, Steve Jobs, abandoned by his biological parents, Larry Ellison, orphan, uh, Michael Dell, put it beside the troubles of Dell, still a huge company, Sure. started as a teenager, didn't even finish college. And uh, that kind of thing happens all the time, if you allow it. Right. And we all benefit from it. It's not zero sum. Right. But many of those same individuals that you cited would say that if they had to start their businesses today, they couldn't do it because of the regulation, the tax ramifications. Well, this is the danger of excess regulation. One, it uh, breeds lawlessness when you don't know what the rules are. Right. And you get tripped up any time a bureaucrat decides to go after you. Mm -hmm. But it means you spend all your time on compliance checking things off instead of focusing on the business at hand. Right. Wondering whether have I got the taxes right for this quarterly estimate. Right. If I buy a new a piece of equipment, what, uh, what things am I trip up on? Right. Do I have all the uh, clearances? So you focus on the peripheral stuff instead of creating that new knowledge, mm -hmm. getting us away from the Stone Age that enables us to move forward. Right. So tell us a little bit about the book and some of its uh, major precepts and, and what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, what we're trying to accomplish is give people the, the, the knowledge to stop the growth of big government, which suffocates opportunity. Mm -hmm. And the w one reason why government becomes m bigger and bigger is it's occupied the high moral ground. Uh, the advocates say, well, big government may be inefficient, they may do crazy things, but hey, they're compassionate, their heart's in the right place, whereas free markets, it's uh, profits over people mm -hmm. and, and, and things like that. And we explain in the book, we turn it upside down. Mm -hmm. It is big government that is selfish, short-sighted, creates conflict, uh, bars opportunity, whereas free markets, because it focuses you on the uh, needs of other people, creates more, uh, does more for people, enables people to have a chance to get ahead. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in terms of humanity, you may not love your neighbor, but you want to sell to your neighbor. Sure. Better you focus on uh, creating a new product than uh, figuring out how to blow up the next door neighbor. Right. Well, even if you look at if two companies decide that they're going to team up to do something devious in the marketplace, if they lose the trust of the marketplace, they will quickly see that their profits and their sales are going to evaporate. However, if two organizations team up with government backing, there's no way to stop them. And that's the opposite of compassion. And all of the things that are often lumped well, upon see, capitalism uh, 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 are... Ultimately, yeah. you're right. Government is about power. Yes. Government has, as uh, one person once said, they have the bomb. Yes. <laughs> They've got the police powers. Right. And uh, so uh, there's coercion. So when they give a guarantee to something, or practice crony uh, capitalism, crony right. politics, uh, that isn't uh, meeting the needs of other people. No. It's uh, somebody deciding something's going to be done, and by golly, uh, we're going to use the power of the state to uh, make it happen. To pick who wins and who loses. And, and which is the, the basis of uh, corruption. Right, right. And so what are some of the, the tips that you tell people that they need to look out for this? This is a sign that government is beginning to overreach into areas where it just doesn't belong. Where do you begin? <laughs> it's a long list. The, 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 the tax code. Right. Why, as a free people, 
don't we understand the tax code? You know, I mentioned nine million words uh, beyond the comprehension of, of, of people. Why not have something like a simple flat tax, single rate, do it on a sheet of paper, a few strokes on the keyboard, mm -hmm. uh, generous exemptions for adults and for children, family of four would pay because you're getting rid of all the clutter, no federal income tax in the first 46,000 of income, only 17% above that, no tax and savings, no death taxes. Mm -hmm. I think people would find well, that, that would be a great liberator. Right. And, uh, and, and, and so uh, that, th those are the kinds of things that uh, we need to do more of and uh, enable people to uh, focus on the real things. But government is always uh, throwing up obstacles. Now, an another example is all the regulations coming with uh, Obamacare, EPA, mm -hmm. and, and or, or Dodd-Frank, the so-called financial reform bill. Right. The language is vague, as we touched on earlier, often contradictory. And, and so community banks are now having to spend more time on compliance. We have a small one in the, near our community. The guys had to hire five people. Just, just to on, keep up with compliance, just, right? Just on compliance instead of making loans. Mm -hmm. I talked to the former head of a bank. He, he stepped down a little while back has 170 billion in assets. He said we had to hire 1,000 new people to, uh, for compliance, which means he said hundreds of fewer loan officers. Right. That's crazy. Well, and the same thing applies to education. If you look at even on a state level, how much money is absorbed in education because of compliance issues or other things or middle level bureaucracy, all of this becomes more expensive, which requires more taxation to occur. And many people are rightfully enraged that people in the know or people with the connections in the right places don't end up paying the taxes that others do. And that's why the, the tax code is so complicated, because people on the inside write the tax law to benefit themselves. Well, and They that, carve out their exemptions. And, and, and politicians love that, because Absolutely. complexity means power. It means you have to give contributions to them, or you can, can potentially get tripped up. You almost and make them sound like shakedown artists. <laughs> Heaven forsooth. <laughs> they have the cloak of legality. That's, uh, the, 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 that's the big difference. Absolutely. And, 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 and in schooling, why shouldn't a, any parent knows no two kids are the same? You may right. have the same parents, speak the same language, grow up in the same house, but profoundly different personalities and needs. And what right. works for one may not work for the other in schooling. Right. So why shouldn't parents be able to choose uh, a school that best meets the needs of a particular child. Absolutely. Because if a child doesn't get an education, how is, how, how is that uh, child supposed to get ahead in this world? It's profoundly wrong that we don't have schools that are working. Right. And that uh, people don't get the instruction they need. And that they have to cut back on uh, sporting activities and music and things like that. Come on. We're the richest country in the world. Yeah. And we're, we're, we, we can't do basic things that we did decades ago. And, and to force children to stay into failing schools just for the sake of well, continuing to pay attention, that sounds the opposite of compassionate to me. Well, look at Washington, D.C. Spends more per pupil than any other school system in the country. And how many members of Congress, how many presidents send their kids to that school system? Zippo. Right. Height of hypocrisy. And in fact, when it started working with the school vouchers and such, that was one of the first programs to get yanked. Well, they had a, a program where, because Congress does run the district, right, uh, where 4,000 kids out of 60,000 could get, uh, in effect, scholarships right. to go to alternative failing schools. Washington has one of the worst school systems in the country, along with Chicago. Mm -hmm. And what was one of the first things President Obama, when he took office four and a half years ago, did? try to kill that program while he was sending his two girls to a good private school. Oh, come on. People would wonder if that was cronyistic, that decision, to actually... It was political payoff. <laughs> it was a political payoff to the unions. And, 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 and so, uh, again, uh, big government talks about, oh, we're here to educate the kids. No, about meeting the needs of uh, a particular constituency, right. special interests, more and more. And, uh, you know, once upon a time, and there was a trade-off. If you worked for the government, you knew you weren't going to get a big salary, uh, but you knew also you uh, would get a pension when you retire, right. and you'd have job security. It was delayed today, gratification at that point. T t t today, you get uh, pensions that aren't affordable. They promised you never put money aside for it. Right. Couldn't get away with that in the private sector without getting in big trouble. Right. 
and uh, the salaries are bigger than what you get for comparable work in the private sector. Right. Again, meeting the needs instead of focusing on uh, the people. Right. And just one final thing on that. Uh, we cite in the book a British historian called C. Northcote Parkinson. Isn't that a wonderful name? In the 50s, did a, a history of the British Navy. And he discovered after World War I, when Britain had the biggest navy in the world, the war was over, so they sharply downsized the navy, you know, mothballed ships, uh, discharged sailors, laid off dock workers. Yet the agency running the navy got bigger as the navy got smaller. <laughs> and he, he observed, in terms of bureaucracies, they will, the, the amount of work they have to do has nothing to do with its size. Right. Whereas in free markets, if you fail to meet the needs of the marketplace, if you get bloated, people will discipline you. Right. They won't buy what you're offering. So we just have a couple of minutes left. What are the top two or three concepts you would like people to take away and into the world to stop this government overreach? Well, realize the real morality is free people in a free market with sensible rules of the road mm -hmm. where you can do more in the future can have a chance to uh, get ahead and by doing so you meet the needs of other people you do lift people out of uh, have the opportunity to lift out of poverty in a way they never would be able to do under a rigid system and so uh, that that's that's the bottom line in terms of morality mm -hmm. and uh, the, everything is to meet that ends enabling people to develop as people learning through success and failure getting the tools to move ahead in this world making a better world, breaking down barriers. I mean, one of the greatest breakdown of barriers is companies like Apple, bringing uh, people all around the world working to, to turn out products. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't come from government bureaucracy. That's from uh, focusing and uh, creating ch well, chains of cooperation. It's just absolutely extraordinary. And because no one's in charge, no one realizes what an extraordinary miracle it is. Mm -hmm. turning scarcity into abundance, creating resources like oil, in and of itself glop. Human ingenuity turned this glop into something that a modern economy can't live without. Absolutely. So in closing, uh, how can people find out more about you and more about the book? Well, uh, the, the book is available at stores and also on uh, Amazon, Freedom Manifesto. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a website, Forbes.com, but also we have a website for the book. Uh, freedommanifesto.us. Okay. We like that, freedommanifesto.us. <laughs> and uh, you, you, you can learn more there. Okay. And uh, so it, it's exciting. And it's about freedom. It's about liberty. It's about what America is. Well, we appreciate you sharing a little bit about the story of Freedom Manifesto. And we look forward to watching it take off and, and helping to reshape the country. Thank you very so much, So if you Chris. hold on for just a moment, at this point, we'll stop for a quick word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. The Conservative Forum of Silicon Valley began with 20 conservatives meeting at a restaurant in November of 2003. Our mission is to promote the principles of American liberty through education. By 2012, we had grown to over 600 paid members. Our monthly meetings feature well-known and prestigious conservative speakers addressing issues that are critical to our country's very survival. This includes speakers like Victor Davis Hanson, Andrew Breitbart, David Horowitz, and many others. In addition to our monthly meetings, we sponsor a conservative local cable access TV show the right side, covering today's topics. Our Constitution Discussion Group not only teaches the Constitution, but started our annual essay contest that awards two $1,000 scholarships to local high school seniors. We are a virtual clearinghouse for grassroots organizations by providing them with table space at no charge in our exhibit area. There are typically a dozen groups represented. If you are like-minded, join us at our next meeting and become motivated and empowered. Liberty made in America. And welcome back to the right side. That was a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. The Conservative Forum not only underwrites this show, which 
for which we're extremely appreciative. But additionally, what it's best known for is its speaker series. One of the reasons we were blessed to have Steve uh, join us in studio this evening is he'll be speaking at the Conservative Forum this evening at 7 o'clock at 432 Stirling Road here in Mountain View, about three minutes away. But additionally, if we look at, and he'll be there this evening with Elizabeth Ames, the co-author of Freedom Manifesto. In September, Elizabeth Nixon, author of Ecofascism, will join us on September 3rd. On October 1st, Robert Spencer, director of jihadwatch.com. On November 5th, J Jim DeMint will be present, and this is also the forum's 10th anniversary celebration, so it'll be a special evening. In December, Michael Ramirez, senior editor and editorial cartoonist for Inv Investors Business Daily, will be present. Again, the forum is hosted at 432 Stirling Road here in Mountain View at the Portuguese IFES Hall, and you can find out more at theconservativeforum.com. In closing, obviously, the topic of Steve's and Elizabeth's book is extremely important to us here at the right side. We do believe that government has gone into a scenario where it's reaching way into more parts of our lives than is reasonably necessary, but also is hampering our ability to get things done. As Steve outlined, it's not only uh, overly aggressive, it's also immoral. We're trapping people in a cycle of poverty in many cases, and indeed, instead of giving people the skills that they need to succeed, we're taking care of them to the point where they're losing the skills and those skills are atrophying, and at some point, there is no return. So please do look into Freedom Manifesto, and at this point, well, we'd like to say thank you for joining us this evening. Have a great night. I've been your host, Chris Pereja, and this has been The Right Side.